We're now going to start shift to the first talk of this session. Um, the next several talks will give you a look at some of the research coming out uh, from Quest and CBMM. Um, and the first one I'm going to give you is Ed Boyden, who's the Y. Eva Tan Professor of Neurotechnology with appointments in Brain and Cognitive Sciences, Media Arts and Sciences, and Biological Engineering. And among many other activities, he leads the Synthetic Neurobiology Group. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really great to be part of this community and see all the synergies between different uh, approaches, trying to understand, build, um, and uh, really get to the heart of intelligence uh, with all of its profound insights into the human condition and also the payoff for humanity in so many realms of, of science, engineering, and daily life. I lead a group here at MIT uh, which works on technology for mapping and controlling the brain. And so one of the uh, efforts that we are uh, uh, participating in is to try to help our community to understand brain circuits at their most fundamental levels. Um, part of the problem, of course, is that brain circuitry is incredibly complicated. Um, if you look at the spatial dimensions of the brain, we're talking about enormous biological systems made of tiny parts. So brain cells are so big, right? In the human brain, they can be centimeters in spatial extent, by far the largest cells in the body. But the wiring of the brain is nanoscale. Um, you know, huge number of orders of magnitude difference in spatial scale. And uh, if you zoom in to an individual, individual connection between brain cells, a synapse, it's chock full of biomolecules, which are even smaller, right? Now we're getting down to single digit nanometer size uh, building blocks. So the brain really presents a unique challenge in terms of understanding how molecules contribute to cells, cells contribute to circuits, circuits contribute to phenomena of great importance like intelligence. So the other issue, of course, in terms of understanding the brain is not just the spatial complexity, but the enormous temporal complexity. So brains, of course, can develop many of their functions and, for that matter, dysfunctions over long periods of time, you know, months, years, even decades sometimes, whether it's learning a certain thing or a skill or a language or there's lots of things that take time. But the quantal building blocks of brain computations are very, very short events, you know, millisecond timescale electrical pulses within brain cells and chemical exchanges between brain cells. So how can we map and control across space and time so we can uh, understand how brain circuits will, will, will work? So I'll tell you two short stories today, one about space and one about time, where uh, we at, at MIT and in this, uh, this wonderful collaborative environment have been working on strategies to try to help the understanding and repair of the brain across these spatial and temporal dimensions. Let's start with space. So of course, there are many ways of imaging the brain. I think we've all seen images like this, brain scans. Uh, they're amazing. They can be of course, non-invasive, which is one reason why they're so powerful. And of course, you're, you're hearing from many other people um, here involved with the quest about such things. Uh, but they, they can't get down to the fundamental nanoscale wiring of the brain, uh, the individual connections, individual synapses, and so forth. At the other extreme are microscopes, which can see very tiny things. But even they can't see the most fundamental building blocks, because light has a finite size or wavelength. And you can't see things that are much, much smaller than that. People have tried to overcome that limit, uh, but these techniques are difficult to apply at the scale that the brain operates at. So here we often try to think of the opposite of what people do. You know, people have been zooming in on, the, on biological systems for literally 300 years by magnifying images. What if we magnify the brain itself? And so uh, we started thinking about swellable polymers, like the stuff in baby diapers. Add water, and as this cartoon shows, a baby diaper will swell, an experiment that millions of babies do every day. Um, and those white threads, the polymer threads, will expand apart from each other. And importantly, those uh, polymer threads are nanoscale and spaced by nanoscale distances. So we started wondering if we did install this chemical spiderweb-like mesh of baby diaper polymer inside the brain just right, add water, could we physically magnify the brain? So that's the basic idea, is to chemically weave this baby diaper material inside brain cells and outside brain cells, in between the biomolecules and around the biomolecules. And amazingly, uh, in early 2015, we discovered that we could, we could do this. So in panel B is a piece of the mouse brain, a few millimeters on a side. Panel C, the same piece of the mouse brain, about a day, day and a half later, we physically expanded the thing by 100 times in volume, about four and a half times in each direction. And the polymer thread, I guess I can use the mouse pointer, is, uh, it starts out very densely packed. The spacing is around the size of a single biomolecule. And at the end of the day, um, it has become dilated in, in size. So here's a little movie of a piece of the mouse brain, which uh, had the baby diaper material installed earlier. And this is a sped up movie, so it's half an hour and half a minute. But you can see this polymerized piece of brain tissue from a mouse expanding as we add water. Um, and the expansion we verified through many uh, studies is accurate down to the nanoscale, down to uh, effectively the size of individual molecules, we think. 
So this is a sort of a weird way of doing microscopy. We made a little animation just to emphasize what we uh, are doing at the molecular scale. So we could take a brain cell like the one on the left, this golden neuron, and we're pulling, the, we're pulling the building blocks of life apart from each other. So we end up with a constellation of biomolecules that have been pulled apart by this baby diaper polymer, sodium polyacrylate, and we can then see their organization. So one of the things we're very interested in is indeed looking at brain circuits and trying to map out how they are connected, how molecules are organized at those connections and along the wiring of the brain. Um, and that could lead to several kinds of interesting contributions to this community. Uh, one, of course, is to look for interesting motifs or organizations of neural circuits. You know, uh, one could also try to work on modeling what neural circuits are doing at different levels of granularity, informed, informed by different hypotheses and top-down ideas to test. Um, and uh, the hope, of course, is that we can uh, use such detailed mapping strategies to, to help out with different kinds of missions uh, that the, the quest uh, for intelligence is, is spearheading. Now, of course, mapping is uh, only able to see things. You can't really prove causality only by a static map, right? These are not even living systems by the time you've expanded them. And so the second short story I want to talk about is about control of the brain. You know, suppose you have a map and you want to figure out whether a certain part of the circuit contributes to a certain function. You could try to use different modeling strategies to infer where in the circuit to perturb. That's one of the beauty of, beauties of, of making such maps. But in the end, you, you probably have to test it with an experiment, right? The brain is such a complex mess. We want to, to prove uh, and not just speculate as to what is mediating a given function. And so one of the things that, of course, we have to confront is the high-speed time dynamics that underlies brain functionality. And to do that, we've been working um, uh, for many years now on this technology where we can activate specific cells in the brain with pulses of light. So brain cells compute using many kinds of signal, but one of the most prominent is electrical signals that are very, very fast, biologically speaking. Um, so if we convert uh, light into electrical signals, say by installing little solar panel light molecules in brain cells, shine light on the brain, which we can bring in using optical fibers or other techniques, and many of us in this community are working on different ways of delivering light into the brain with interesting patterns and so forth, then we could control specific cells, turn them on or off, and figure out what kinds of processes they could trigger. Um, so the basic idea is that there are all sorts of different cells in the brain. Some are big, some are small, some excite, some inhibit. The list goes on and on. And we don't even have a full list of all the cell types of the brain uh, of, of almost any species except for a small worm, which has only a couple hundred neurons. But suppose that we can take um, this technology, which we call optogenetics, opto for light, and genetics is, gen is genetically encoded, we can express it in certain cell types using all sorts of genetic tricks pioneered by many people in this building and around the world. Then you can uh, aim light at a single cell or a set of cells, as you see in this cartoon, and turn those cells on or off, depending upon the identity of the molecule. And so this strategy is being very, very widely used um, throughout neuroscience to activate and silence brain cells and figure out how they initiate, sustain, or are needed for different kinds of, of uh, uh, behavior. Uh, I'll just show one example because it's got a cool movie associated with it. But you know, one of the things that many people are interested in is about what facilitates learning. And um, can you modulate it? Can you control it? What are the parameters that are important? Um, and so here's just a very simple experiment where dopaminergic neurons deep in the brain of a mouse were made sensitive to light. An optical fiber was implanted, aimed at them. Every time the mouse goes to the right side of the box and pokes its nose at a sensor, it'll get a pulse of light. If it goes to the left-hand side of the box, then, then nothing will happen. So here's the movie. The mouse pokes its nose, gets a pulse of light. You can see the optical fiber lighting up. And basically, this mouse is working for light. It'll do this over and over again um, you know, uh, for a very long period of time, actually. So one of the hopes here is that through causal perturbation, one can then investigate what a model or what a map might predict in terms of an interesting point to intervene and allow you to prove out a specific consequence, um, which then, of course, close, could help close the loop and, and feed back upon new ideas so the, the cycle continues. Uh, but it's also interesting because just last summer, um, an interesting plot twist occurred, which is that a European team used one of the molecules that our group reported in 2014 and showed that they could be expressed in human nervous system cells. Uh, they took a person uh, who is blind, who lacks the photoreceptors of the eye, and could make the eye see again by making the spared cells of the eye sensitive to light, basically installing a genetically encoded camera, if you will. And so it's very intriguing to think about you know, um, how the kinds of tools that that we all are developing here could potentially not only uh, help drive the science of intelligence, but you know, we know a lot more about the eye, of course, so we know about the rest of the, the nervous system and the, and the brain. Uh, as the knowledge of maps and, and models uh, matures, could we have other kinds of optical neural interfaces to the brain that could be used to, to drive other functions? And with that, I think I'm out of time.
And I will just acknowledge that this describes a huge amount of work by many people. So.